I want to talk about on this Robert Hunt Financial YouTube Live something called a buffer fund. A Wall Street Journal article this week by Eric Wallerstein outlines buffer funds and that they are currently seeing record inflows. Headline reads, buffer funds see record inflows as investors hedge. Subheadline, the exchange traded funds aim to guard against losses up to a point while limiting potential gains. I think these are dangerous for just about any investor because of what an investor has to believe to invest in these type of products. So just to explain what a buffer fund does, let's say you just wanted to invest in a plain vanilla index fund. It's called an S&P 500 fund. And that was it. But as time went on, you began to be concerned about who knows what, a potential recession, the volatility in your portfolio. Someone comes along and says, hi, I understand you might be a little nervous about your investing. And that you'd say, yeah, I'm down 10%. What if I could give you a product that would actually limit your losses? So you actually wouldn't be down that much. It's called a buffer fund. Well, what, what's not to like? Well, a whole lot. So no surprise, these funds are more expensive. So while your S&P 500 fund might cost 0.03% as an expense ratio, which is very cheap, and it comes out to almost free when you use the right type of products, these buffer funds can cost 20 times more than that, 30 times more than that, and even more. But also, what do you have to believe as an investor? You have to believe that volatility is really bad for you and that you can somehow get excellent returns without it in the stock market. So there is no free lunch. You've heard that phrase. The returns that you receive when you buy that index SPY or whatever other simple plain vanilla index fund, S&P 500, the volatility is what keeps people out of it, which is why you deserve that return, despite not plowing a field or fixing a roof or fixing a toilet, or doing any sort of labor. You're just allocating capital, letting it sit. But in order to get that outsized return, you have to avail yourself of the volatility that comes with it. These buffer funds are saying, nope, we are going to buffer you. We're going to cap your downside and cap your upside. And uh, won't that help you? Over the long haul, as an investor, to invest in a product like that means you really are you have a very low conviction on owning companies. Because what, what is investing? You're just owning individual companies that have been amalgamated together for you via an index fund, you, you probably shouldn't own anything at all if, if, if you cannot withstand any sort of volatility. You might not be in a financial place to withstand the volatility. So I, I would tell you, it sounds like you may be a candidate for owning some fixed income bonds, holding more cash, investing in a different asset class, but I would not touch these buffer funds. I did a quick, I looked at one of the buffer funds the article outlined PFEB, the U.S. Equity Power Buffer ETF from Innovator, which is one of the largest groups, the article explains, who puts these together. And I just said, and they, on the website, outline, gosh, when the stock market's down, as it currently is, these funds look pretty good, which makes them enticing. So I can look at, um, they're, I'm looking at the website now, and I see they're highlighting the S&P 500 and where it is, and it's lower than their buffered fund. Well, I went back and I said, all right, well, how, how long has this buffered fund existed? Well, my data goes back to February 3rd of 2020. And so I said, all right, what if we started from February 3rd, 2020? And we compared it to just the American index fund stock market. The buffer fund returned 10.7% from February 3rd, 2020, which is as far back as I can go. The U.S. stock market returned 16.3%. That's only, you know, that's two and a half year period. Those gaps in performance over long periods of time are going to increase more and more and more because your upside is capped. Your upside is capped. It might feel great on the downside, but if you're a student of financial history at all and you believe in markets and believe in innovation and believe in increasing earnings and growth, what's going to happen? You're going to, you know, if this is 1800 and this is 2022, this has been the long game. When you introduce a buffer fund, you're now going to end up here over 200 year period. You've now become a market timer. 
You now have to guess when to invest in the buffer fund and then when to release the buffer fund because as elated as you feel in a market downturn, you will feel incredible angst looking at what you've given up. So avoid the buffer fund. Be willing to have confidence in your investment thesis that being long U.S. equities and global equities is good and you want to do so at as low a cost as possible over as long a time horizon as possible in as simple a manner as possible. So these buffer funds violate all those concepts of personal finance. Keep it simple. Keep it low cost. Keep it plain vanilla. Avoid the buffer. You'll be better served.